So, all right, mm -hmm. let's uh, get started uh, since we have a little bit of time and I think we have 45 minutes. So it is, uh, let me see, 30. So at um, 1140 is when we're gonna be done. Okay, so thank you everyone for coming into this room. Uh, my name is Joyce Strong. I actually wear a few hats. I'm uh, a board member of the Riverside Food Systems Alliance and I'll explain who they are. I am also a third generation farmer here in the IE and I actually work for the city of Riverside um, and work with a number of community groups in the Riverside area on food systems development. So um, second slide here, um, the Riverside Food Systems Alliance, what is it? So let me back up a little bit before I talk about Riverside Food Systems Alliance. So in the city of Riverside, which is the 12th largest city in the inland, I'm sorry, in the state of California, uh, it has about 330,000 residents. And within the city of Riverside, it's about 81 square miles um, and is considered probably the capital of the IE. Um, uh, uh, and within the city of Riverside are about 4,600 acres of zone agricultural land that remains. And the, if you may or may not know, um, city of Riverside is the home of the Naval Orange. Um, it launched the citrus industry uh, many years ago uh, uh, at the turn of the um, uh, uh, 19th century and was really home to uh, probably about a half a million uh, trees, citrus trees, and really grew the citrus industry. And so fast forward to today, um, what was, remains of the citrus industry is in what's called the Arlington Heights Green Belt, which represents about 4,500. 4,600, 4,800 acres. Let's just round up and say 5,000 acres, okay? And um, um, in 2014, the city community member, community leaders, um, and uh, the elected official that represents uh, the uh, Arlington Heights Green Belt came together and said, what do we do about this green belt that has really turned into a brown belt? And so the city then sponsored a community-based um, convening uh, a conference where there were more than 400 folks that came to it and said, what do we do with the screen belt? And in that conference, the message that came back from the community was that we want a local food system and okay, we want this local food system. How do you do local food systems? So the city then uh, paid for a consultant to work with about 85 community members to talk about what a local food system looks like and, and so that 85 group of folks developed the Food and Agriculture Policy Action Plan, which provides the short, long, and a medium and long-term vision of what a food system looks like. And this group of folks um, were really forward-thinking. They include farmers and growers, local businesses, a variety of different government entities from the local to the county level. Um, a lot of our in institutions, um, including education, healthcare was at the table, and of course, community and non-government organizations, NGOs are there. And when they looked at the local food system, then what does that mean? They really identified what's called six um, pillars, six, six areas of what makes up a food system, right? It's about the farmer and uh, agriculture is a base industry and it creates job opportunities down the pipeline um, in food production, in distribution, logistics, and retail, and wholesale down all the way to our consumer level and at the restaurants, right? Um, and part of the sustainable agriculture or local food system is also about developing, you know, and supporting demand for local. Um, less than 1% of the food consumed in our communities in the Inland Empire actually is grown here, right? Um, it's also about addressing food waste, right? Because there's so many resources that goes into producing food. The other thing that is really important for the local food systems is building distribution capacity around supporting smaller and urban farms, right? Much, if you look, if you think about agriculture traditionally in the Central Valley, maybe out in the Coachella area in Arizona, it's very, very large scale, hundreds and hundreds of acres, right? And our distribution, the national distribution network is really servicing the larger networks. And so when we're talking about agriculture, in a more urbanized environment, we're not gonna be farming on hundreds of acres. And so uh, creating distribution capacity and infrastructure around that to support more smaller farms, right? And then it's also about um, the food security and, and justice piece of it, right? Um, creating um, some opportunities um, to access food um, you know, for all community members. 
And, um, and so, so the question we have today, and that's been kind of been discussed throughout this convening so far is, you know, how do we look at land use and support local food systems? And how do you do it in a way that is economically viable? Because when you, when we look at agriculture, you have to consider it as a business, unless it's a, uh, maybe say community garden, for example, that is run by a nonprofit or community members, farmers, I'm a farmer. Um, farmers have families and they put their families, you know, their kids. Um, I went to college. I went to graduate school. My parents helped me out. Right. Um, farmers have bills. And so considering agriculture, must, we must look at agriculture as a viable business operation, okay? like any other businesses out. So it's important to do that. So really, the question is, um, when we look at the IE and when we look at agriculture and opportunities, I found this uh, resource um, and I thought it was really, I think, a good way to frame how we value agriculture. And agriculture is very much tied to land use, right? So this is from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, UN so FAO um, for short. And they, they you know, frame agriculture. Our traditional model looks at ag in terms of how we prioritize ag and the food system. And they split it up into basically three economies, so to speak, describing in three economies, right? You have the market economy, which is the all the activities around production and moving it from the farm all the way over to basically you and I, um, rather we're acquiring it at a farmer's market, at the grocery store or in a restaurant setting, right? So that's the economic piece of it. They also describe um, the food or agriculture as a nourishment economy, right? And this is related to human health and nutrition that we receive from the foods that we consume. And then the third uh, uh, economy, uh, regarding around agriculture is looking at economy of the, um, the ecosystem, the environmental resources and the environmental setting in which agriculture produces, right? Without land resources, without um, natural resources, um, you know, we, we, we need those resources to grow food to nourish us, right? And so our traditional model is very much market driven um, so that we, it's, it's driven really by two areas, right? Market driven, and it's nourishment uh, driven, right? But at the expense of the ecosystem. And so as part of the Riverside Food Systems Alliance conversations around developing local food economies, we wanna flip that switch around or change it around so that, um, so that we can, okay, so I'm getting asked to um, uh, expand the slideshow. Okay, does that help you see it? Yes, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay, so flipping the conversation around and really looking at um, how the market economy and how the nourishment economy is set and supported by the natural resources, right? So again, this really points to um, sustainable land use and the competing. Um, in, you know, we talked about it in other uh, future. Uh, I'm sorry, the previous breakout sessions about um, land use, right, and competing uses with uh, land use. So. Um, so anyways, so I just wanted to frame it in this way. How do we look at the different economies of agriculture? Right? Um, and so I want to jump back then to kind of the work of the Riverside Food Systems Alliance, of which I was asked to share today. And um, since its launch in about 2014, 2015, what's happened in the Riverside community and kind of driving and looking at how we build capacity in the, in the local food system. Um, so here's a quick timeline of lots and lots of activity in summary. Because of the work of the Riverside Food System Alliance and its partners, I, um, probably about $7 million, $8 million of investments have been made in building different programs that have come out of um, the local food system. And, and it's not, it's not a, a one-party effort. Um, you know, having this convening today shows that the, making change and moving the needle in this area takes collaboration, it takes partnership, and it takes being present at the table to help um, uh, have those balanced conversations and others understanding, right? So I'm going to go through a few examples of how agriculture and um, elements within the, our local food system contribute to economic development in a balanced manner um, that meets the three different economies that I just laid out. So um, in one of the uh, things, one of the pr primary key projects that the Riverside Food Systems Alliance partners have been working on is we realize that you cannot have a local food system and you cannot continue to shepherd or, uh, or 
or to shepherd land resources, you have to have farmers. Okay, so I'm going to say that a different way. You can't have a local food system without farmers. And we are lacking in this particular area here. Um, I'm a third generation farmer. Uh, I'm a young, young, according to the average age, the, um, any guesses on what the average age of the farmer is here in California? Put it in the chat. 55, 65. Any other 65? All right, 40s? Um, I'm in my 40s, so. Uh, the actual correct answer, the average age, depending on who you look at, is 65 to 68. And this is an average age that has been increasing the last several decades. So what does that mean? It means that our aging, our farmer population is aging, and that next generation to bring down the average age is not coming into this field, right? And so when we talk about farmers losing their voices in the IE, farmers, quote unquote, selling out their lands, right? There's a number of uh, contributions contributing to that because one, could it be that the farmers and their next generation aren't interested? Um, they're retiring out, their kids aren't interested, right? But I want to say, though, that based on the work that's happened in the last several years across the different groups in our region, is there interest in uh, small, small ag and agriculture based in urban environments? Yes, absolutely. What we found, though, is that the programs around hands-on and vocation-based training is missing. It's missing. And so the Riverside Food Systems Alliance has worked with multiple partners to develop farmer training programs. And so this is all under the Grow Riverside Initiative, which you guys have figured out is what the Riverside area has called the local food movement and its efforts. Um, and so one of the efforts that the Riverside Food Systems Alliance have done is that um, in 2018, the city worked with a number of partners. We wrote a grant to the state and won a $3 million grant to acquire seven and a half acres in what we call the Northside community. And this seven and a half acres um, will be, uh, is, is we just closed escrow on this land and we will be developing it into not only an urban greening space, but also a space to, for farmer training programs. Um, and uh, as you can see on this graphic here, it's called the Northside Heritage Meadows Project. Um, and there are multiple elements. So the grant pays for um, 453 trees and shrubs to be planted to help sequester carbon. Um, build, and and there, we also have another grant from CDFA for soil building um, uh, uh, activities at the project site. Um, we have a number of education partners here at the table, um, and they include uh, UCR Extension, Field, uh, Five Keys, um, and Riverside County Workforce Development Board. Um, this space, this uh, uh, urban ag training center, future urban ag training center is, um, is community-based, and it is in a community that is a food desert. And so therefore, there's going to be, we're working, we will be working with Riverside University Health System to um, uh, establish a farm stand or market space here that will uh, be EBT, um, except EBT as well. Um, and, and then we have also here the California Natural Resources Agency and, and the Fish and Wildlife, they're engaged partners because funding comes out from them as well. Um, and so, so, so you know, uh, an important piece of this kind of pipeline of creating resources out in the community includes programming and then along the pipeline including you know creating opportunities for internship um, beginning and hosting of beginning farmer training programs this is an old slide but just check out the uh, the flow diagram so to speak is really what's important here uh, creation of apprenticeship programs out in the community and farm incubation and so uh, last year the Inland Valley Farm and Food Consortium was actually formed by five nonprofits and education partners and said, you know what, we need to work together and create these training resources out in the community and work with our various education partners to create these opportunities. And then students and participants that come out of these training programs, we have to put them in places where they're incubated, et cetera, and things like that. So um, we can ask questions later on of me later, but I wanna keep going. And then so we have time to um, do Q&A in our Jamboard. Another uh, significant project that's happened out in the Riverside areas, remember I talked about building the infrastructure to support smaller farmers. 
Um, ours in Riverside, we have two school districts and the larger of the two is Riverside Unified School District. Um, and they actually in 2019 um, were, got very creative and went after a couple of grants in which they received to see if they can pilot what's called a food hub, which is basically a middle person that distributes, you know, that is a recipient of materials, assembles it and then sends it out to, uh, to its customers, right? So a food hub for, for farmers. And, uh, and so the, the um, food hub in total since its um, uh, inception has been a recipient of about $2.8 million in public funds for, and to, to launch it, to do its operations. And, and so they work with today over 20 local farmers um, and to buy produce that goes out to a, a, a smaller school districts that would like to do farm to school programming but don't have the capacity to do that. They also send it to local hospitals, um, local restaurants, et cetera. Uh, last year when uh, COVID hit, um, many of our restaurants were impacted. So that space uh, for the food hubs distribution shrunk. However, because the federal government um, did the farm, what was it called? The family, farm to families food box programs. The RUSD food hub, because of the work in its food systems was really set up and ready. And it was a recipient of um, almost one and a half million dollars. And it packaged almost a hundred thousand food boxes in the span of three months that got distributed out into the Riverside and uh, community area. It, it included county and the city areas as well. And, and one of the things that we realized too in working with the food hub and putting these uh, community boxes together is these are federal dollars coming into our community. And we, the food hub looked for opportunities to buy from local farmers so that those dollars stay in our community and rather, you know, where, where possible. One of the challenges that the food hub has uh, come to and also supports, you know, the efforts related to, to creating farmer training programs is that we don't have enough farmers in our community who have that capacity. So again, um, it's the fact that we have a food hub in our region is really a leg up in helping build um, economic opportunities around food, food and agriculture. And then the, the last project I'd really like to talk about is the Riverside Food Co-op. This is a, uh, a co-op is actually an, an actual legal entity um, that is incorporated, but they are a not-for-profit model. Um, some of you may have in other communities visited a co-op or grocery store. So Riverside Food Co-op um, is a member-owned organization, um, and their vision is to open up a future store in Riverside and co-ops are interesting models, uh, business models, because not only are they member owned, but their focus is that they are there to support local producers and local vendors. They create jobs, et cetera. And so um, while the food co-op um, right now is in the process of uh, working on some feasibility studies of possibly where to locate a potential store, um, and they are... Um, about 450 uh, members right now, my numbers may be off, um, don't quote me on that, but their membership has continued to grow in the last uh, few years. Um, but in the meantime, uh, as they're working on creating more, uh, building membership and doing more um, uh, fundraising around, you know, creating a vision for the future store, they've been very busy with uh, community-based type programming. Uh, we worked with uh, the food co-op to receive a state grant of, and this state grant allowed them to buy a refrigerated van. So there's a picture of the van on the middle there. And this van um, last year during the pandemic was used to help um, distribute those community food boxes that the school district packed. Um, and in particular, uh, we're able to deliver these food boxes to senior citizens to their doorsteps. Um, and then a program that uh, food, the food co-op operates is the Riverside Food Rescue Program. This is a volunteer-based program. There's a lot of produce in the form of fruit trees in backyards. And often some of that, you know, those families that have them aren't able to uh, consume it. And so they were then um, able to um, do a, a gleaning program and uh, send it over uh, these gleaning, pro uh, pro harvest these fruits, from the backyard and also food donations as well, and then work to get it out to our pantries in the communities uh, to rescue food so that it doesn't land in the 
end up in the landfill. Um, and so um, I'm going to end with uh, going back to revaluing agriculture and land uses, right? Um, this is a graphic that comes from the FAO and looking at how sustainable food systems um, and, and how we do land use and how the, um, what the benefits are around this kind of wheel diagram that you see here, right? Uh, so I'm gonna pause there. That's the end of my presentation. Before we go to Jamboard, I wanna open the floor up to see if there are any questions that folks might have. Okay. Any questions? No? Okay, so then we have a few Jamboard questions um, to solicit some input and feedback. And those questions um, are listed here. How can we come together to support work around agriculture and land use? The second question is what kinds of land can uh, what kinds of land use can improve community health in the IE? Um, how is land linked to other justice issues in our region? And then how can you, what do you, what are your, uh, how do you imagine vacant lots in your town and how can they be put to use? So I'm going to ask our group facilitator to um, drop the link in for our Jamboard. Yeah, I do that again. Okay, and then, when you do that, I'm see. I'm gonna pull up my jam, the jam board on my end as well, and screen share. Nope, not that one. This is it. I think I just sent it as well. Yeah. Okay. Here you go. And if someone um, can't uh, post, you can always type it in chat and I'll post it for you. Okay. Thanks, Sonia. Okay, so, so our first question is um, for the group here is how can we come together to support work around agriculture and land uses? So I'm not, I don't speak Spanish. I'm wondering if, um, if our translator can translate. So I'm not gonna move them. No, you're good, you're good. I can always move them as well. Um, okay. But yeah, one of them is basically saying to volunteer work. So some responses so far, educate the public. I see education um, like three times. Start building a framework of metrics that includes soil fertility, nutritional availability, calculating the costs and impacts from lack of nutrient dense foods. I have a feeling that may be from Guru Mahatra, who's in this group. Um, good response. Education, right? Celebrate farmers, putting, putting them on a pedestal. Yes. Get a clear understanding of current land use. That's fantastic doing that background and understanding where folks are coming from. What else? How else can we come together to support the work of agriculture and land use? Supporting farmers with our money, absolutely. You vote with your dollars. 
educate the public on how to get involved in the process. You have lots of education. Educate. Um, reparations of land to Black, Indigenous, POC, and away from corpse. That's an interesting one. Um, did you know 95% of our farms in this country are family owned? 95%. Show up at local government meetings to advocate for zoning laws shifts. Yes, funding allocation. Sharing current data to determine our land goal. Yep. There's another one. Um, these are great. Keep keep throwing those, keep posting. Work with legislatures to fund regenerative ag rather than big ag. Reaching out, getting engaged. These are great responses. Any others? Identify opportunities. So zoning. So for our first one, really, uh, we were to <laughs> make farmers sexy. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so if we were to um, lump these uh, uh, categorically, I think it's about farmers elevating farmers and their roles, right? right. Um, second one would be really zoning um, to, to support land use. We have also, uh, what else? Um, education is another theme. Uh, communications is a theme. So I'm gonna lump communications and educations in the same space. Um, cooperation. Yeah, any others? This is fantastic. Do, does anyone want to speak up? Um, unmute yourself and kind of make any other comments or questions here regarding the slide. Hi, right, this is Sonia. Um, I didn't say, um, I didn't mean to say make farming, farmer sexy. I mean, farming, like, you know, make it more appealing, not farmers per se. <laughs> so I just want to clarify that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, I think understanding what the public process is to know where we can intervene is key because sometimes the, the, the process doesn't have the perspective that is in this room or in this conference and they don't know any better. And if we don't tell them at the right time, they're never going to be able to consider different ways of doing things. So they need to hear from us and they need to hear in mass. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think Guru Mantra, your comment about that, you know, it's strange that I come from private sector and then now have a foot in government. And um, I would say a barrier to this, you know, the, the local community in um, uh, having a, an influence in the process is the lack of understanding for what how the pro, public process works. So that might be, um, we can put that as a suggestion on educating on how the public process work and how, what does that look like mapping it out for folks, right? So um, is there anything, let me check the chat real quick as well. Um, any questions in there? Okay, so Sarah has a question about um, the lack of farmers and curious about the racial demographic and what is being done to target black and indigenous farmers. Sarah, I actually uh, was looking at a study uh, a couple days ago and the number of uh, black farmers and indigenous farmers is like in the single digit. Like I wanna say um, one or 2%, so, so minimal, right? 
And this is um, every five, I think, I can't remember, it's five or seven years, the, new, the census um, tracks um, uh, does an ag census. And so I, I think a re, the re, most recent one came out a few years ago. And so how we know this information are our actual farmers filling out the census and self-identifying themselves. And so um, through that process, it's the number, again, is in single digits. However, we do have um, something like 30 some percent of farmers are actually women owned or women farmers. So that's a pretty significant one. Um, and so I'm really glad that there are folks here in this convening and speaking up for um, uh, you know, the minority farmers and, and providing a voice for that and continue to do that because otherwise, you know, it's part of the, the uh, public process. If you don't speak, others will be louder than you and, and their concerns get heard. So it's really great that there's a, you know, that we're creating this forum for different voices to come to the table. Um, let me keep going. Um, so Guru Mantra, your comments about, yes, working Riverside Food Systems Alliance is working on getting infrastructure in place, uh, in, in particular community-based infrastructure, right? That can be, um, um, uh, be uh, uh, access, uh, accessible to, to all. Andrea, thank you for putting in the link on the Next Gen Farmer Training Program. I believe there was a question about that, um, how to participate in the farmer training. Um, there are a few um, uh, uh, resources out there, a few programs out there. I'm going to put my email in the chat and you can send me an email for follow-up for these more specific questions. So So the few programs include the Horta program, the beginning farmer training program that Riverside's working on. Um, it took a hiatus during COVID, so we are working on relaunching that hopefully this uh, fall. And um, in one of my earlier slides, uh, the Riverside Food Systems Alliance, I would recommend if you'd like to get involved, stay involved, stay informed, um, visit their website, which is, uh, I'm going to type that into the chat. Um, and there you can sign up for their mailing uh, email list. And so when announcements for the next gen farmer training programs come out, they will definitely send that out for recruitment of the next cohort. And then another program that is out in Norco is actually the um, uh, operated by Five Keys EAT program, E-A-T. So again, if you're interested in that program, um, send me a note and I'll respond with the contact there. Okay, so back to our chat board. Um, these are great, creating pathways for financial security. So, all right. Um, are there any more items that you want to post here? This is great feedback. And then we still have a few more Jamboards to go through. Okay, so let's go on to our next Jamboard question. And this is, could this be another group putting it in or is this our group? Um, so it's all groups are putting okay. it in. Um, so okay, so all, so then our group is gonna have a turn now then. Um, so what kind of land uses can improve community health in the IE? So go ahead and put your thoughts in this. And I'm gonna move these around so there's room for our group. Any comments here? Aside from what's already been put up by um, other members. Parks and trails, gathering spaces. Let's see what others put down. Land uses, community health, um, organic farms, habitats. 
bike trails, garden, community markets, farmers markets. Anything to offset carbon in high paved areas. And then you feel free to also put um, some comments in the chat as well. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes. So let's see, let's go back to um, here. Any other additions? If not, I'm gonna move on to the next gem board, but this is some good thoughts that the other group has put in. Okay, moving, oh, I saw one get posted, sorry. Schools near homes, land uses, yep. Okay, let's go to the next Jamboard question. How is land use linked to other uh, justice issues in our region? So please go ahead and input your thoughts here. I'm sure there are some, um, some thoughts on this one. This one is a little bit more um, thought provoking. Any thoughts on this one? How land use is linked to other issues in our region. So access, opportunity, and proximity to services. Healthy and affordable food. Yep. What about housing? There were some conversations about housing earlier and competing land uses, right? Um, we've seen a rise in the IE in housing prices and housing affordability. What we saw during the pandemic, and this is anecdotal that I've been hearing, is that you know, housing is generally more expensive out in Los Angeles, as well as Orange County. And with many folks being able to work from home, it put, freed up the opportunity to move in other, into communities that are more um, affordable than LA and Orange County. And Riverside and the IE has definitely seen the growth um, in, and the boom and a demand, high demand in a variety of different housing, right? So when we look at housing affordability, is that a justice issue? Um, I wanna throw out there a question. I think that we you know, need to understand when we look at challenging land uses and development, right? The state identifies uh, as background information, the state of California looks at projection growths. We are a state, California is a state, with projections in a growing population. And between now and 2029, the state estimates that to meet our current um, demand for housing and the demand over the next several years, and I mentioned in the session earlier, 1.3 million new housing units must be built. Where do those land resources come from? Does it come at the expense of agriculture? What are some innovative and alternative solutions looking at housing justice, right? Housing affordability um, and food and other competing land uses? It's a complicated, complicated question. Okay, so you've got more uh, items in here. So climate change. Land use linked to climate change, linked to um, um, food access, uh, employment as well. And then I think um, someone put here, this is in Spanish. Oh, uh, let's see. 
we're going to be leaving our, oh, I think we're going back to our breakout room or the main room pretty soon. So, okay, let me see. There's one more jam board. Imagine a vacant lot in your town or city. What could you put there? Let's provide some of this feedback for, for the um, organizers. When we get back,